I got some updates for you about SARS-CoV-2. First up, I had an article out last week in The Atlantic about the case for masking kids. I pointed out that there is no international consensus on whether or not to mask school-aged children. And in fact, the United Kingdom has never masked a child younger than the age of 12 as a mandate in school. Now, of course, my article was really a call for cluster randomized control trials. These are the only trials that can adjudicate the claim as to whether or not masking kids offers a benefit in the reduction of spread of SARS-CoV-2. We just don't have those studies. So as far as I'm concerned, we have no good data that masking kids lowers the spread of SARS-CoV-2. And there certainly are downsides, as I describe in the article. Now, many people have come back at me and said something like, well, the Bangladesh study, the Bangladesh study. I read the Bangladesh study in detail, and I should have an op-ed on that this week. But my point about the Bangladesh study is, first of all, one, cloth masks failed to improve outcomes in adults. Let me say that again. Cloth masks did not work even in adults. So what do you think they do in kids exactly? If they didn't work in adults in Bangladesh, are they gonna work in kids? Now you might say, well, what about surgical masks? And I'll concede to you, this study is great. I mean, we learned about surgical masks and I'm gonna promulgate that in this article this week. But the masks that we've been having kids wear all this time, they are not surgical masks, they are cloth masks. We're making kids wear this mask that has failed in adult testing. And we don't have cluster randomized trials for kids. Somebody said, well, is the mask gonna filter different in kids? I guess hypothetically we're talking about a surgical mask here because that's the mask that works. And I would say, no, I doubt that the surgical mask will filter air any different, but I do think kids aren't little adults. They behave quite differently. For instance, I've never seen a bunch of adults lay cots out next to each other side by side at work and take a, say, two-hour nap when they take off the mask. I've never seen that, but I do know that young kids do that in daycare, and so that's one key difference. Somebody else fired back at me and said, when they sleep, that's actually when they stay the furthest apart because kids are playing on top of each other all the time. And my argument for that is, are you trying to make my case for me that kids' behavior is different than adults' behavior? Because it sounds like you're making my case for me. I think we have a problem when we cannot acknowledge that the evidence for something is weak when nations around the world, our peer nations, just don't do it. I mean, what are we to think here? Do we really think the evidence is strong when the United Kingdom just doesn't do it? Do we think the evidence is strong when Sweden doesn't do it? The fact that other peer nations are not doing it is a clue that the evidence is not as strong as you think. And so if you want to keep saying the evidence is very strong, you're going to lose a lot of credibility because I know, as someone who's only studied medical evidence for 15 years, that the evidence is not strong. And many other people who are sensible and can read know it's not strong. If you think strong evidence is a confounded observational study, then you got to get in the ivermectin business too. That's all they have either. You know, they have bad randomized trials that are increasingly falling by the wayside and confounded observational studies. You want to have a consistent framework for evidence. And when it comes to these kinds of interventions, that framework is cluster or individual randomization, depending on the question. For question as to whether or not an intervention can cease spread in a community, the cluster design is a nice design because it doesn't tell you whether or not it stops it on the way out or whether or not it stops it on the way in, but it does tell you that it stops it or slows it or impairs it. And that's what we found from Bangladesh. More to come on Bangladesh. One of the most interesting things that happened this week is the response to the Atlantic article. And that response was a lot of people who agree, and I think a lot of people in Europe who strongly agree, and then some people who thought that they want to cancel their subscription to the Atlantic. And I joked that you might as well cancel your subscription to your eyes and ears if you don't want to in confront information that runs against your priors. The world is full of things that may contradict your worldview, and you need to embrace it, take it in, think about it, and maybe change your mind, or maybe not. But the idea that you have to censor or remove every piece of information that you dislike, that's a very childish emotion, and it's a very childish response. And it's something that's taken greater hold in our public consciousness. I find it very odd. I'm not familiar with a world where anytime I read something I don't like, I want it removed. There are many randomized control trials that I dislike a great deal, such as the polo trial. You know if you listen to this channel how much I dislike the polo trial. But I never asked the New England Journal of Medicine to remove the polo trial from their website. I think that's a bit bad. Alistair Monroe. The person you need to follow if you're interested in kids is Alistair Monroe. He's a pediatric pediatrician, infectious disease expert. He's a researcher. He's in the United Kingdom. And he has a lovely thread out just now about the IFR in the UK for kids. And he argues rather persuasively that the IFR is about one in 120,000, which I think is consistent with some other estimates. What does this mean? If that's the risk of SARS-CoV-2 in terms of fatality for kids, and of course hospitalization is much more frequent, but that's the IFR for kids, and you couple that with what's the seroprevalence in kids, you start to get some idea of what the risk-benefit profile of a vaccine in kids has to be like to be palatable. So for instance, the higher 
the number of kids who've already cleared SARS-CoV-2, the tougher it is for a vaccine to really make a case that it can offer an additive benefit because you have a lot of kids out there who are already rather immune to the virus. And the lower the IFR, again, the higher the hurdle a vaccine has to clear before it comes to, I think, widespread use. The United Kingdom has decided not to vaccinate anyone under the age of 16 and only to give one dose for 16 and 17 year olds. That's different than the United States. And that's because they actually have good data on seroprevalence. They have good data on IFR and hospitalization so they can kind of do this calculation. We shall see as we go to five to 11 what it ought to be. But I think we need new seroprevalence data to answer that question. So my overall thoughts today. One, I think it's quite funny that people would say that the data to support masking kids with cloth masks is robust. The data supporting cloth masks is not good for cloth masks at any age. We should be moving to surgical masks for adults. And the data in children is non-existent. There has never been a cluster randomized trial of kids in school. The Bangladesh study does not apply to kids in school, not because the mask works any different, but the kids behave differently. Also, kids have not been wearing the mask that's worked in Bangladesh, which is a surgical mask. So at a minimum, as we move forward, we need to switch to the surgical mask, at least adults and children, we need to do a cluster randomized control trial. If you run it with a large enough sample size, not only can you ask, answer the question as to whether or not masks slow SARS-CoV-2 spread, you can actually include an interaction coefficient and ask if that depends on the age of the child. Now this is really cool and interesting. You can basically take the recovery model and ask if age interacts with the delta between mask, no mask, and maybe it's possible I don't know the answer, but I'm just speculating. It might be possible that surgical masks for kids work above age 8 or age 10 and maybe not below that age. It could be something that you don't quite expect where neither the critics nor the proponents are totally right. And there's a need, a societal need to do those kinds of studies to tease that out. We don't want to live in ignorance. We want to know that answer. We want to recommend it where it works and which mask works. And we don't want to recommend a mask that doesn't work in whom and to, to whom it doesn't work in. So I think it's very clear these kinds of studies are necessary. The fact that the economists are the ones doing the Bangladesh study and not the CDC, it's really a failure of US systems. And the fact that people go on Twitter and they very confidently proclaim that the evidence is strong when it is in fact no such thing, I think is a failure of medical education. We have failed for so long to try to teach people how to critically appraise evidence. That failure is revealed every time we, we review a new drug-sponsored study, and that failure is also revealed when we start talking about NPIs that are really start to become more tied to our identity, our politics, our brand, tied to our tribe. It's a very dangerous situation. And so if you take a lot of people with poor training and evidence appraisal and get them to believe rather fervently that this is the right thing to do, they view it increasingly in terms of moral terms and less and less in terms of the evidence. And I think that's where we are right now, and it's a deep problem. And this problem is a problem that will someday come to bite us in the ass. It will someday be used for something that we don't like or that does have perhaps even stronger downsides. And that won't be a good day. And there's another way this is going to play out that you'll have to stay tuned for because I'm working on something to try to flesh that out. So if you like this video, which is really a video about SARS-CoV-2 and where we are in the moment, like, subscribe, leave a comment. You know the drill. And next time we'll be talking more about Bangladesh. So... Stay tuned until next time.